So, uh, just come up here? Or? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I met Jim in, uh, I think, 1999. Both of us were affiliated with organizations that were working on uh, the Y2K problem. And we solved that. So Jim, <laughs> Congratulations. Jim, Jim has decided to take on a bigger problem. Um, but throughout the years I've known him, he's been my source of a deepening understanding of the role that nature plays and what, what we, the legacy that we have through that 3.8 billion years of evolution and how rich it is and how for granted we have taken it. So, um, He's going to deepen our appreciation of that today. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm a biologist. I, my, my two real jobs were in the U.S. Army as a medic and in the chemical industry for 20 years as a trainer of technical people. But I had a biology background at, you know, from college. And I was really lucky because I grew up in the woods uh, watching birds in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and I did my college time at Rice University, which had just amazing teachers and, and that kind of thing. But I, I drew this uh, years ago when the climate activists were asking me, like, um, how do we, you know, I, I kind of like the climate activists. And I've known Adam for quite a while. But it was like, uh, I didn't think it was a, I, I thought it was more of a biology problem than it was a, a culture problem. But, but you know, and, and for about 30 years, I've been looking for places where the land is getting better. And one of my, it's one of my special places, because I'm a, an owner, is Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> and I thought, what if the wolves came back to Yellowstone? And there were people predicting that if they ever came back, that uh, we'd see an increase in the soils, and the beavers would come back, and that kind of thing. And it's exactly what happened. When the wolves came back, the, the elk herds had to run. And they couldn't stay in the creek all the time. And the beaver came back, and Yellowstone's water table is starting to rise. And I thought, well, all right, where are other places that are doing that? And almost everywhere I went in Texas, it was somebody that had learned from this guy named Alan Saber, who had spent a lot of time in New Mexico and was teaching people. And a lot of my friends were, um, you know, the people that were teaching me. Where, where people that had land and they were actually seeing the land start to come back. At that time, you see this part right here. This is uh, one of the ranches, this is a Maddox Ranch. We'll go to that and see some more about it. But at the time, we thought, well, the, the way carbon gets down into the soil is through dung beetles. And um, tons and tons per acre, possibly. So you need a lot of poop to do that. Well, you've got to feed the animals, you need a lot of grass. Savory's really brilliant thing was that in dry landscapes, the animals have to keep moving. You know, you, you can't have, and, and so I'm, I'm going to tell you that kind of story. But more, more recently, the story's been glomalin. That may be even more important, is the fungi in the soil. If you have fungi in the soil, what will happen is the mycorrhizal fungi, the, the stuff above the ground is giving a lot of its carbon from photosynthesis to the fungi to improve the health of the soil. And, uh, Glomalin is a glycoprotein that we don't know very much about. This wasn't discovered until the 1990s. Um, but it's, it's a very stable compound. It's almost plastic-like in some ways. And it holds water like you wouldn't believe. So that's, a, that's a kind of an introduction. So we'll see this picture again. And then here's, a, this is in Vermont. These Margot and Heather are the dirt. We don't use any chemicals on that farm. So. So that was a statement I made to the climate people. It says, well, if you make soil, you can end global warming. And I thought somebody come up and correct me on that. But, uh, wow. Well, there you go. So biodiversity for limited climate. What if we uh, lost biodiversity? What would be the consequences? You know, and you say, well, fresh water, we've got problems there. Food, uh, well, we, we, we make a lot of corn. Is that high quality food sometimes? You know? uh, disease processes and loss of climate stability. So those are my big four. And somebody asked about the Pleistocene, the megafauna. And imagine North America looking like this. And it wasn't that long ago when the mammoths were roaming around. And then we had lions here. You know? And uh, these animals disappeared. And there's, you know, people 
we're just starting to understand, well, why, why did they disappear? Was it because humans showed up in North America? Uh, might have been part of it, might have been climate change. But just recently from, a, you know, there's a scientific article, there was an article in Scientific American just recently, big animals are like the nutrient arteries of the planet, and if they go extinct, it's like severing those arteries. What are they talking about? You know, well these animals used to go down, because there were predators around, they'd move in herds, they'd go down in the wintertime and up in the summertime. And they brought a lot of food. So, David Biello's comment was, we have a poop paucity predicament. <laughs> so, I thought that, that was... Here's another example. This is a picture of something that happened in history. Kind of an artist. Anybody have any idea who that is? What's that? Audubon. Audubon. John Audubon, Audubon was uh, talked about 200 years ago, 2000, uh, 1813, he sat and watched passenger pigeons crossing the Ohio River, and it was, he figured 100 million, 100 million birds per hour for three days. You know, billions of birds plus, and these guys would come north, you know, and bring the nutrients from the south every spring. And every winter they go back. And, uh, you know, sometimes the, the soil was two inches thick mm -hmm. from all that food in some places. They were a very gregarious species. They may not, not have been around for a long time because, the, you know, the, the uh, ecosystem was changing in North America. But a hundred years later, um, anybody know the name of the last passenger pigeon? Martha. It was Martha. She died, uh, she was, for decades, scientists tried to find a, a passenger pigeon to mate with Martha in the Cincinnati Zoo, and they never found one. And, uh, and when did she die? September 1st, 1914. 100 years ago. So. Now here's another nutrient pump in the Pacific West Coast, sockeye salmon. Now how big were these fish? Well, that's a grizzly bear. Oh, can you imagine how many, how much phosphorus was getting into that land? And uh, you know, we we have a uh, anadromous fish on the east coast too that we haven't seen in years and years. And in New England, we're starting to talk about that a little bit. So here's the Great Plains, and uh, you know, this is the post office, 34 cent stamps, trying to trying to help us remember what it was like. Now I'm going to ask you. Now you're in a big herd right here. But imagine if there were 100,000 of us moving, and we're all buffalo, and we're worried about those predators out there, which were wolves and mountain lion and whatever. And imagine, you know, like we found this really good stand of grass. Imagine what it smells like after a day and a half. What do you smell like? Ammonia. Ammonia. <laughs> there you go, a chemist in the crowd. So, so what happens? Somebody in the crowd has got the best nose. And they start saying, well, I can smell sweet grass, because the strippers of these perennial grasses, if, if, they're, uh, if they're working real hard, you can smell them from miles away. And they start moving in that direction. And then people, you know, different buffalo are kind of saying, well, what, what, are they, what are they smelling? As they move in a certain direction, they start smelling that sweet grass and move towards it. Now, when would they come back to this spot that we're in? They wouldn't come back until they could smell the sweet grass. It might be six months, it might be two years. That's how it used to work. Okay? And there were, you know, there was so much grass, the soils were eight and ten feet deep in a lot of places, and there's a lot of carbon in eight foot deep soils. So, so that's, uh, let's go back to 1957. There's people in New Mexico now that say the big blue stem is an invasive species. It used to cover the state. It was an incredible grass for grazing. They used to have antelope by the millions. How many people do you see in this picture? <laughs> do you see the second guy? Who's was sitting on the soil that the big blue stem was trying to hold. This is like a remnant big blue stem they found in 1957. And look, he's lost four and a half feet of soil. 
That, that was the clown who helped do that. Yeah. You know, the, there was a big battle in New Mexico over whether we should grow grain or have cattle. And the, the farmer tradition won, but the soil blew away. And most of this stuff on the bottom is very limestone-like, uh, very concrete-like. And so if water comes on it, it rolled, runs away really fast. Very hard to bring back. This is West Texas. Anybody know what that is? Cotton. Cotton. Those, those dales are about the size of a school bus. <laughs> now, you see a lot of organic matter in the soil? You know? Water hits that and just runs off. What does this look like? Remember that? Anybody know where that is? That's the Red River. It's in November, so it's not the middle of the summertime. And that drains the Panhandle of Texas. That's a huge drainage area. And, you know, I walked out on it and got samples with a shovel. Um, so, I'm, I'm saying that we're, we have an extinction episode that we're in right now. But this is kind of a special one because we're having a soil extinction. I don't know if that's happened like that before. And it started with a megafauna extinction because we didn't have enough poop coming to the land. Then barbed wire made it hard for the herds to go find the sweet grass. So they were continuously grazing in the same area. And then after a while, the best grasses were gone because they were being re... You know, they didn't wait until it was sweet again. They had to re And so you start losing your best grasses. This is where Alan Savory really helped us think about this a lot. Continuous grazing will kill the land, especially in dry climates. But you can do it anywhere. And that's what overgrazing is. It's almost a... A human invention. And then the plow created the dust bowl. You know, the land wasn't doing very well out there when they got rid of the buffalo, and it wasn't doing very well when they put in barbed wire. But when, it, when you started turning the soil over, that's when it really accelerated. And then now we've declared chemical warfare on the land. Most of our farmers and ranchers pay an enormous amount of money to the chemical industry, which I used to work for, and they're not getting their money's worth. And they kill them in the soil even more. What, what chemical fertilizers do is they kill fungi. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we have herbicides and pesticides and everything. They kill almost everything else. And the soil is absolutely what we depend on. So, photosynthesis is a process in plants that takes carbon, out, carbon dioxide out of the air and makes glucose, makes that sugar, and then it gives as much as a third of it to fungi or to microbes in the soil. Why would a plant spend so much of its energy on the soil microbes? And humification, making humus, is what goes on. You know, agriculture chemicals make that almost impossible. This is uh, Texas also. This is near where my nieces live. And I worry about them. Um, you know, we used to see this caliche in Albuquerque and and out west, in West Texas. This is like limestone, right on the surface. And they're trying to grow, uh, grow grass here. You know, they're trying to grow hay. But there's not much organic matter in that soil left. This is in Dallas. This is 40 inches of rain a year. This is not West Texas. And, uh, so caliche is a, it's, cal it's a Spanish word, but it's calcium in the soil. This is actually what you're saying. And um, that's like, to me, it's like Alzheimer's. This is Alzheimer's in the soil. Where's all that calcium coming from? It's, well, calcium's in the soil. Oh, it's just what's and, 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 and plants need calcium. But we're getting to the point where the organic matter's gone to the step that we're getting down to bedrock, even in Dallas. And, you know, it just makes it that much harder. What about the role of tractors and compacting the soil that also supposed well, to be? Well, I'm going to give you some examples of people that were doing something different. And, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, this isn't all bad news. This is hopefully getting good news. Uh, you know, I'll just say, I'm going to kind of skip over this. But most of the extinction, ep extinction episodes were caused by CO2 levels rising so fast that the temperature, the temperature, um, melted the ice on the planet, 
and then the Arctic and the equator were about the same temperature. And then you'd have things like, a, look down here, they go anoxic, they go anaerobic. Black Sea does this a lot now. It puts out hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen sulfide fumes. How many know what hydrogen sulfide is? H2S. H2S, what does it smell like? Right. It's the rotten egg smell. Yeah. It's pretty toxic. It makes you it makes you want to run away. In the chemical industry, I'd see this a lot. And uh, so yeah, that, that was. Uh, and what makes that come out? Well, there's no oxygen in the ocean. The ocean doesn't circulate anymore. It doesn't right. pick up enough oxygen, and you get these kind of blasts. And when it gets to the land, you know, stuff that's pretty big that needs to breathe has a hard time. It's very acidic, so plants die. And this used to be how most extinction episodes happen. They, they, when they found out the dinosaurs died from a meteor explosion, you know, they thought, well, that was how all the extinction episodes happened. They looked and looked and looked and looked, and they couldn't find it. And they started realizing most extinction episodes are hydrogen sulfide coming out of the ocean because we don't have enough ice on the planet. So. Doesn't, doesn't the um, ice also release methane gas? What's that? Doesn't the ice also release methane gas when it melts? Methane oh, maybe a little bit. Clathrates. Yeah. yeah, maybe a little bit. Oh yeah, if you want to heat, well that's, that's the other theory. <laughs> that uh, if we heat the oceans enough, that we'll get methane out in such amounts. And that, that's possible, I guess. That there's a lot of methane in the, in the oceans. And in, in methane ice. And if you start melting that. So that might be something that happened a lot faster. You know, so yeah, that's uh, something to think about. You know, that might have a spike in temperature. Methane is not very stable though, and bacteria love it, and they use it for energy. So I don't think methane will be a long-term problem. It may be only a few hundred years or something. So, you know. <laughs> so here's here's what I I want, I want people to look at. I was a medic. I thought about what if you were a medic for the land, and if you saw a bare ground. I'm, okay, let's say. Let's say you see somebody laying in the street when you're going home, and they're unconscious and they're bleeding. What would you do? You know, would you just drive off? Would you run away? You know, most humans pretty much know that they get on your cell phone. Yeah, get on your cell phone. You call somebody. If you don't know what to do, you'd, you'd call somebody. And and what what we're trying to get people to think about is, if you see bare ground, that's affecting your life. That's not normal. See mud in the streams, that's not normal. That's not the way nature wanted to do it. Not when it was making a, a habitat for, for mammals to live in, anyway. And graying vegetation, that's not normal. And now losing glaciers and sea ice. Now, is, now you guys call them 911 when, this, when you see these things? <laughs> yeah. Imagine if 10,000 people called up the, the governor every time they saw bare ground. <laughs> you know. What is graying vegetation? Graying, I'll show you, I'll give you an example. Oh, yeah. um, vegetation is green when it comes up, the animals love it when they do. If, the animal, if, the, if it turns brown, it still has nutrition for the animals, but if it turns gray, it has very little. So if you're a grazier out west, you want to you hit that stuff before it turns gray. And it takes, you know, a year or two, so, so you have time. Um, so I'm, I was going to show, how's my time? I don't know, about 10 after. Now we're getting into these kind of, um, these are the appetizers. I'm going to show you a lot of appetizers of what people have done where things got better. And I start with Dana Meadows. It says, hierarchical, hierarchical systems evolve from the bottom up. The purpose of the upper layers is to serve the purpose of the lower layers. <laughs> so now we're here in Washington. <laughs> How are we doing with this idea? <laughs> are, are, the, are the upper hierarchies uh, helping the lower? And, and so Meadows was writing this book, book for a decade, and she died before it was finished. But she had sent it to so many people that they collected all the notes together. And they decided, where are the places to intervene in the system? And, you know, what, what you're told by a lot of people is, we've got to go out and get more data. And Meadows, kind of after all her research, decided that that was probably the twelfth thing to do. It's the twelfth best way to do it. Uh, mostly they're not. So when I saw that, I thought, well, let's quit doing that. Let's learn about self-organizing systems, mm -hmm. which is nature. Let's make goals. What do you want? Alan Savory helped, helped me learn a lot about that all the way from the 90s. Because he keep asking, what do you want the land to look like? Do you want it to look like it is now? 
John Todd was a real key to hear because he was teaching me you throw all the, all the critters into the ecosystem. And then Lynn Margulis might be the most important biologist of the 20th century. And that was the guy hypothesis. Adam was talking about a little bit about the, the idea that the Earth is a, is a huge system. And then she even has one where she's saying, how do we transform uh, our own paradigms? Because that's where the real work's done. John Todd, I worked with him for a while. John Todd, uh, this is a waste lagoon on Cape Cod. Cape Cod doesn't have a lot of fresh water. And they were trying to clean this up with these cylinders, and they had a lot of success. And John would just throw every, everything he could think of into those cylinders, and the water would get cleaner. So I was working at the chemical plant, and I thought, I've got lots of chemical wastewater, and this stuff worked in the chemical wastewater. And these are anaerobic bacteria working on the side of these walls of these clear tanks. These are fiberglass tanks. Making a lot of, you see, you might see oxygen bubbles there. Making pure oxygen in a very anoxic environment. A lot of sulfur coming up from those. Uh, turn your head sideways, and this is a placostomous fish eating the algae on the sides. And, uh, and then, you know, if all your ponds look like this, well, eventually we had so much cover, we found out that we loved uh, hydrogen sulfide. And it would, you know, that's a good fertilizer, you know. Duckweed's uh, one of the, you know, there ought to be species of the month, you know, because it's really good stuff. And essentially, we're, we're, this is all chemical wastewater stuff. You know, these fish were reproducing, and we didn't give them any fish food. They were living on chemical wastewater. But they had a lot of stuff upstream. This is a self-organizing system. Anybody can do this. That was John Todd's point. You know, you don't need a scientist to do this. Anybody can do this. It doesn't hurt to learn from scientists, you know. But uh, this was the lab results. Ammonia is pretty toxic at, uh, you know, a few, few parts per million to fish. And we got it down to, this is after 18 hours. Chloroform, we couldn't get rid of in any of the water in the plant except for in this system. And uh, BPA, some of you know about hormone, hormone disruptors. We did a lot of that because we made, made polycarbonate the plant. So. So I wanted to put a picture up of Lynn Margulis. Symbiosis is the key to evolution. And she was a microbe person. She re redefined evolution from the bottom up. And Darwin would have just had a field day with her. See, because Darwin didn't have the tools that she had. You know, Darwin was not the last word in evolution. And a lot of people misinterpret Darwin, I think. Darwin said all species are, were related if you go back far enough on the tree. Okay? But a lot of people say survival of the fittest. Which is true in some ways, but it's it's been it's been overused, I think. And so I, I just say symbiosis is a much more hopeful interpretation. And then you say, Marcos kind of put the tree back together. That there's chances, like in lichens, you've got uh, algae and fungi working together. Okay. So this is kind of maybe the most important idea in this whole show. And uh, you know, Marcos book. Acquiring genomes. I've got a lot of books up here, but uh, this might get you on a whole new path. It took me a long time to figure out what she was talking about because I wasn't a microbe person. I hadn't studied that that much. So, so here we are. Um, how do we make? How do we put it back together? And you see on the map there. This is the map of where pronghorn antelope used used to be in the tens of millions, and even into Nevada, which is very dry country. And, uh, and I'll just make a comment about the prairie dog towns. Prairie dog town the size of the state of Maine. And they had about 400 million, million animals. If you're, a, if you're a raindrop landing in Texas in this prairie dog town, and you've got a prairie dog hole every 20 feet, how do you become a flood? <laughs> You know, it's the west where we see these biggest floods now. When we get a big rain, the water runs right off because it's caliche. And uh, so what we're trying to do is, how do you make holes in the ground? And uh, so that's, uh, oh, there's some numbers. One pound of carbon per square foot, if you added it, was, would, uh, we got 10 billion acres of bare ground in the world. That's about 200 gigatons. 200 gigatons of carbon is 100 parts per million. 
So, you know, it's, it's doable. Nature knew how to do it. It's done it before. Made ice ages before. Somebody asked about that. So we're going on to the Maddox Ranch in West Texas. This is out near the Pecos River. This is in January in an area that didn't have any perennial grasses for years and years because they didn't have any animals. And we thought, well, let's run sheep and cattle at three times the recommended rate. And uh, so those are the three. Uh, Maddox is in, 18, in 1986 in their first ranch with three million dollars in debt. They didn't know quite what to do. And uh, they were spending $200,000 a year on chemicals to fight the mesquite, which is a bush that's got a lot of uses, but they thought it was a problem with the water. And uh, so they just, you know, you know a lot of people that have gotten in kind of this kind of box. But the first thing they did after meeting Alan Savory was to look at their finances and saying, we can't afford chemicals. You know. Then they, then they uh, were noticing some things on the ranch where when they had animals put in one area and they were making a lot of food, they'd see the comp patties disappearing. So these folks come out, the husband and wife team, and comp dung beetles for a summer. And the numbers they came up with is, oh, a ton, an acre, a, a ton going down per acre overnight. If you can get your animals close enough together that the dung beetles can smell, can smell the stuff. But they also had to go off antibiotics for the animals because uh, the, anti or the, the antibiotics kill the dung beetles, you know. So the poops, the poops essentially toxic in that case. But they learned that they didn't have to do that. So le learn about dung beetles. They actually roll up these balls. The flies can't use the dung, the, the dung you know, the cow patties because they dry them up too fast and they take them down. And so you don't have a fly problem that they used to have. The babies live inside these these little dung balls. So, you know, cows, even with four stomachs, can't digest cellulose very well. And they poop out a lot of stuff. That's a resource. You don't want to put that in a lagoon and make methane. You want to get it out on the land. Okay? So that's what they learned how to do. They got out of debt in about eight years. They got what? They got out of debt in about eight years. They were, they were paying $900 interest on the debt every day. Imagine... Before you get a cup of coffee at McDonald's, you have to find nine hundred dollars to pay the, the bank. You know, this is the the map of where dung beetles live. They don't live in the permafrost. That's hard hard work. But imagine dung beetles could be everywhere, but they largely killed out by the fact that there's no animals on the land, or we're using chemicals on the land. Uh, this is the Maddox Ranch. And they had a pretty good rain one summer. Uh, this is uh, Malcolm Beck, who's a big um, compost guy down in Texas. He's famous for bat guano, and getting bat guano into his compost, good source of nutrients. But he came out there and said, cane blue stem growing out here, out near the Pecos. I didn't know it was within 200 miles of here. It used to be everywhere, you know, really good grass. So he wanted to have his picture taken next to that. <laughs> And, uh, and then something really weird happened. One of the reasons they got out of debt so fast was they started talking to hunters in Houston and, and Dallas, and they come out to the ranch and have a deer lease. And you know, you're, you're moving your herd. Every, every week they move their herd, and they have 25 paddocks. And so let's say that the cattle are over here this week, and they put the hunters over there by the, the electrical people over there, by the house, house fixer-uppers. And um, so now, where, if you're a deer, where do you go? You know? So think about, think like a deer now. You start hearing hunters shooting over here in this corner, you're going to be over here by the cattle. They, they never lost much wildlife. And I remember when I was there one time, I had 200 turkeys wake me up. And they said, well, that's more turkeys than we have in the whole county. These are huge counties out there. So I've, I've been trying to think of how do we get wildlife to be an asset? for farmers, so they can help make, make a living. Here's another farm. This was taken in Missouri, Greg Judy's farm, but I'll, I'll just skip around here. Abe Collins in, in Vermont, he's showing off his soil that he's making. And he runs animals so tight, and he moves them a couple times a day. And this is a tumble wheel. He just rotates it. And when he shows up, 
the animals just line up because they know that the best grass is coming. You know, you don't have to punch cows, you just move the, move the tumbleweed. You know, and look at that grass that they're moving into. So Judy has really become determined to feed his most important source of livestock, and that is earthworms. And he figures if he can get to 25 earthworms a square foot, that they'll, they'll make castings that are equivalent to 100 tons of castings. So, so when he moves cattle into an area, he only lets them eat about a third of it. And they tromp down a bunch of it, and then they move on. And then the earthworms go to, go to town. Yeah. You know, so, that's, uh, so he won't do anything that would hurt the earthworms or the dung beetles. And if he's got cattle that, that can't live without antibiotics, then he, get, he moves them off. You know, they go to the next, and he's learning about it. Now, he, he's really good, though, is the fact that he wrote down everything that he's doing and puts it in a book. And he started in, in 2000. He had no money, no animals, no land. He was going through a bad divorce. And, uh, but he knew about animals. And he thought, what if I leased land from people that had land and didn't know what to do with it? There's a lot of land like that these days. And uh, older people, we've got a lot of ranchers and farmers that are in their 60s and 70s that want the young people to come out, but the young people can't afford to buy the land. So this leasing idea, I think, is really important. People can learn how to do that. They'd be doing something for the climate if, they, if these people had a, had a grazing plan. Or, now what Judy's also done, he says, well, what about other crops and things that I could do? And he met up with this guy. This book just came out. Mark Shepard in Wisconsin. This is the most... When I heard Greg Judy was getting involved with him, I thought, well, I better read his book and see what he says. Because I'm thinking about how to build a savanna in New England, kind of like the Indians had years and years ago, where you had animals, but you also had a lot of nut crops and things like that feeding your system. And, uh, you know, that could be pretty cool. This is what this looks like in Wisconsin. He's, he's done key line plowing and he has rows of, of trees and, and, and crops and stuff like that. I'll show you a little bit more about that. But he's got a, an aisle in between every one of those rows for grazing. So he doesn't have the intensity of the number of animals, but he's putting a lot of poop on the ground too. He sees that as being important. And here's his six layers. And so imagine if you had chestnuts kept collecting, you know, and if you don't have chestnuts to start with, you start growing them. And then you have, he likes really, he likes hazelnuts, he talks about hazelnuts. Let them grow as a bush because they're a lot more productive, don't try to make them a tree. And then your bears will show up, you know, you know, if you, if you want bears, you know. But, uh, but then he's got all kinds of fruits and stuff like that in the understory. And you say, and then he's got mushrooms and grasses. And uh, the grasses, of course, feed his animals. But say, what if... So he did a cost comparison. He does a lot of numbers in this book. And he says, well, you can make $1,000 an acre on corn, but you're going to pay, you know, a certain amount for your chemicals. So maybe $1,000 maybe an acre. But chestnuts, if that was your goal, you might make $5,000 an acre. And you'd still have room to grow currants, asparagus, cows, hogs, turkeys, bluebirds, least weasels, and three endangered flowers. And what's really cool about Judy is he's, he's leasing land, and every year it gets more biodiverse, and he's making a living, and people are, are wanting him to take their land and lease it. Well, they're, they're essentially giving it up. They'll say, what, $10 an acre a year? Or nothing a year, because uh, we want you to manage the land. This is the kind of feature that we need. Now, a lot of carbon's going down in a system like this, if you're climate-oriented which sometimes I am. But, uh, and so now the fish story, and I'm trying to get Philip to, he solved, uh, what did we solve? Y2K. <laughs> Y2K, there you go. <laughs> the reason we don't have any fish coming to New England anymore is because the Menhaden can't get past Virginia. And that's why Chesapeake Bay is dying. This is, Menhaden are the best algae eating fish in the world, and they're being fished out in Virginia waters, and they don't get to Chesapeake. And they used to be so good at cleaning up Chesapeake, they just keep going north and they go around Cape Cod and 
tens of square miles of schools, huge, huge, huge schools. So we're trying to get to that, we're, and there's a lot of people working on that. But what I couldn't believe is the story about the sea run brook trout. There's the Menhaden story, okay. But uh, the sea run brook trout up there, there's there's uh, streams up there that had, we were putting hatchery raised trout into them for years and years and years and years, and everybody thought that their wild fish were gone. And then they stopped putting the hatchery fish in, and they started finding wild fish in many of the streams. Not all of them, but maybe a third of them. Not a lot of fish either, but they thought, gosh, what if we took care of these streams? Would these fish do better? And then they found out that these fish will actually go out in the ocean and go five miles upstream, or five miles along the shore, and start looking for other streams that they could, could benefit from. And so the wild fish are still there. And so my kind of goal is, well, you have a farm that does something like this, and then you send a note up to Boston and say, why don't you come down and go fishing? And you can pay a lot of money to us people that own the farm, and, you know, fishing is <coughs> part of your, your product. And uh, so, how are we doing? We got, we got uh, a few more minutes. Um, Liquid Carbon Pathway, Christine Jones. Christine Jones is one of the most interesting scientists that I know of because she's trying to nail down what's going on with fungi. She's in Australia. Her website is called AmazingCarbon.com and I've just learned so much by reading about what she's talking about. And Liquid Carbon Pathway, what is that? That's, that's sugar water, that's glucose. And she's saying that a huge amount of it in a healthy system is going down into the fungi and then feeding the microbes in the soil. And she's trying to, to build a case for that. I'll just put a picture up here. I've got, this is kind of more, we don't know what glomalin is and some of these other things because every time that you, you work in a lab, you wash away the outside of the cells. And we just never knew about it. This is the inside of the cell. And this is what can grow on the outside of the cell. These red, red hexagons there are like glucose. They don't represent glucose. There's just all this really, interesting stuff that would grow in the soil that we're just starting to understand. I just thought I'd put that up there for, for uh, you know, figure that out. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, this is your membranes, which we, uh, you know, we're finding out are just much more ephemeral than we thought they were. They just change and move and so forth. And yet, they do this all the time. So, so what if your fungi were soil brain tissue? How much, uh, we're finding some of these networks are acres and acres in size. How much area does it have to cover before it becomes conscious? <laughs> how, big, how big does your brain have to be before it becomes conscious? You know? And I, I don't know what they're thinking about, but wherever you see something like this, the, the minerals are moved around. Plants that need minerals get them, you know, you know, because they're getting so much sugar that they have to, you know, take care of their part of the garden. They can go look for minerals much easier than plants can send roots out there to get it. And this is my hand. This was uh, actually in Maryland at, at Pogo's, up there near Olney. And I was growing mushrooms for Pogo for a year. And uh, out, of, out of, you know, strong, we're trying to figure out could we, um, there's shiitakes, um, there's oyster mushrooms. And uh, yeah, it's just mycelium that's looking for and this is the depth of the soil here. You know, these, these plants would be six feet high and they'd have roots down ten feet or more. And then over way off on the left is somebody was asking, well, what about turf grass? Do you see any, do you see turf over in the corner there? How much, you're, the reason you have to use so much fertilizer on turf grass is because you can't go, there's no roots. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a good way to pay the stops company money or whatever you're, your favorite uh, turf grass people are. Uh, Paul Stamets, everybody should know about Paul Stamets, this is the big fungi guy. Fungi.com, uh, largely self-taught. And uh, so, so my case is more poop, more possibilities. And more fungi, more future. And climate will just be a, a sideshow, you know, I, I think. You know, I just got one more example here. Um, maybe I got three, three examples. This is a rainfall map. You see the you can actually see the rain falling, right? 
And you notice the 100th meridian, in, when I lived in Texas, they say, well, once you get past the 100th meridian, that's a really brittle environment that you have to have a grazing plan for sure. And uh, where do you think that the grazing plan wouldn't work? <coughs> what, what, what is your eye drawn to in that picture? Nevada. Nevada. Yeah, everybody <laughs> says that, you know. And uh, let's go to this spot right here in the middle of Nevada where they get about four to five inches of rain a year. It, it varies a lot. Sometimes they get ten. But uh, this is a gold mine, gold mining tailings pile. They ran cyanide through it to get all the gold out. So it killed everything in the soil. Then they ran water through it to, to uh, clean, you know, clean up the cyanide. And then it was evaporating a lot of that, so there's a lot of salt crusty stuff on it. And then they had to grow something on it by their agreement, and they couldn't grow anything. They tried about three times. Who's they? What's that? They. Who's they? Oh, it's a mining company. Mm -hmm. this, this happened in the 80s. And, and uh, you know, I heard this story, and then I went out and tried to find more about it. And, and uh, Dan Daggett used to work for the Sierra Club. He used to fight with ranchers all the time. And then he started seeing stories like this, and he, he decided that he became a promoter of grazing in, in fertile landscapes. And uh, he's quite a guy, quite a character. This is uh, Jerry Tipton, 1989. They went and found everybody's cows. They brought, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to get the numbers right. So they had tons of hay that they had, and they brought it in, and they spread it out on the area that they wanted to see improved. And she hauled 100 bales of hay up that hill that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she's pretty tough, but the animals followed her up. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then this was her husband later. You know, they, they, they think there was about an inch of rain there. Wow. You know, and uh, so that, that was, uh, yeah, that's what it says. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was about 1,200 uh, pounds of dry matter per acre. It was the most grass they'd seen within 100 miles in years. But it turns out Nevada used to be, because there were so many antelope at one time, before there were barbed wire fences and things like that, they used to have grass. So there's a kind of a summary of, if you can do it in Nevada, is my point, you know, the driest part of the country, then other places it, it doesn't have to be this hard. And it wasn't particularly hard. And this is, what's this look like? <laughs> this is in Nevada too. They don't have a lot of trees to work with. They don't really need trees. They'll just start if you allow them to live. We've been killing beaver everywhere. And because we think they're a problem. And this is this is in Nevada. This is Susie Creek. And the news, you know, Courtney White has had people all over New Mexico trying to slow down the water so that they can start restoring the land. And he's got people building dams and you know little check dams and stuff like that. And now he's finding out, well, Beaver can do this for free. <laughs> and used to do it everywhere in the country. And the land doesn't look more like this in a lot of places. This is in Alberta, in a place where the beaver came back. And all that's been documented in a movie recently. And then we're finding, where did the beaver used to be? Nevada. You know, so, the, you know, the really good beaver were farther up north because the fur was so, so rich. The Canadian government started killing beaver because they didn't want... Americans going up into the parts of Canada that nobody lived in. So, you know, we were killing beaver down here and they were killing beaver up there so we wouldn't go up there. <laughs> and I wanted to show a segment of this movie. Um, I, may, I, may, I may try to do that still. But this movie just came out. This is an incredible movie that uh, came out on public television on the Nature Show. And it explains beaver have to dig down very, very deep the pools have to go through the, the summertime. So they will go down as deep as they have to to hold enough water to survive through the summertime. And uh, because of that, after you have a few generations, they've got pools here, 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 and the streams start running pretty much year round. And uh, Carbon Ranch in Colorado. Uh, Elaine Ingham, compost tea, learning about the soil, and some guys up in Alaska took her ideas and made a book out of it. And so you can meet all the players in the soil. The nematodes are in here. How many people are nematode fans? <laughs> all right. This is a good group. So there, 
there's uh, the, you can see the soil food web on, on Elaine's. Uh, so people should know about Elaine Ingham's work because there's a lot of hope in there. So paradigm to, paradigms to consider. Thinking in holes is, is important to making better decisions. I think if people knew these kind of things that were making decisions, they'd probably make different ones. And I'm kind of rooting for, let's get some people making decisions that, you know, to know this stuff. Or get different decision makers, maybe. Uh, Technology is sometimes important, but biodiversity is ten times as important, I think. And you can start anywhere. You don't need to be a scientist or whatever. You just start trying stuff out. Nature is self-organizing and relentless. There is going to be an ice age again. We could be part of that, or we could fade away and not be part of that. Microbes, microbes in any system have to have a good home. And uh, Peter Dunham and I always put this in. What are the incentives for dividing an opportunity into problems? <laughs> if you spend less time on problems and more time on possibilities, you know, are you part of this fragmentation? Are you fighting over resources with all these other groups in order to make your point? And these are my homeschooled kids. I teach, uh, they're 14 to 16, they're working on their, they're going to take their AP biology test in March 11th, or May 11th, and they, uh, none of them are going to college next year, they're just getting ahead of the game, you know, but uh, this is a living machine, this is a, uh, Precious Peary came over from Zimbabwe and to, to speak at our conference, and uh, she showed up and she's been um, flying for 48 hours, <coughs> she shows up at the end of our class and you know, hanging out with kids, and uh, you think know about her, and there's the, the Harvard Museum. So that's kind of what I, you know, get, gets me excited during the week, because these kids are really learning fast, and teach them about restoration, and teach them about what they want to have happen, and uh, they're talking about coral reefs and things like that. Uh, somebody said something about lawns, I wanted to say something for the dandelion. <laughs> dandelions are some of the best things you can imagine because they have deep tap roots and they pull calcium up from down low. And uh, you need calcium to grow all kinds of things, including clover. If you, if you have dandelions, eventually the clover will come and then you've got nitrogen. Then you don't need, you know, Scott's fertilizer. And notice what happens to dandelions once the clover starts going crazy. And if you've got clover, you can have grazing animals too. So, so, so that's... that's uh, there are those who are trying to set fire to our world. We are in danger. There is time only to go slowly. And there's no time not to love. <laughs> so that's uh, my story. Can I ask you, uh, in, in the work you're doing, uh, farm livestock are playing a far more important role out west than the native Would that be the case? Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat the question? Um, we're saying that the, the farmers are using using cattle I rather know, than... I've got a supplementary language. Right? Yeah. Using cattle rather than the native ungulates, he's saying the ruminants, grazing animals. The, the interesting thing about out west is, it, you know, in Zimbabwe, for instance, Alan Savory was a wildlife guy. And he hated the idea of cattle for years. That was his paradigm he had to go across. And uh, when he started running, he got five tribes to work together, which hadn't been, happened before. And he starts running a lot of animals. And they couldn't get enough animals after a while. They're, they're, they're getting more grass now than they have animals. But what's happening is because the water's coming back to their land, the wildlife's coming back too. And so if you have a goal of bringing more wildlife to land, and, and the Maddoxes saw that same thing happen, you know, so if you want to raise elk or something like that, you know, that's that's a possibility. But you have to have water on the land, you know. So. Oh, he had a second question. Yeah. Just a quick supplementary. Obviously, uh, in, in that situation, you, you talk of Yasta and the idea of the tropic cascades and how the mm -hmm. world's created. Mm -hmm. uh, we've kind of part with you, but uh, there, there is some conjecture of whether that's actually the case. Well, there are people that will say that, yeah. I, I personally think that uh, that Austin Chase was right when he predicted that if the, the wolf 
came back, the beaver would come back, and that would change everything. So. But what, what I'm trying to say is that, okay, if, if the large carnivores are reintroduced in these areas amongst them, mm -hmm. that trying to then farm livestock alongside, which is trying to achieve this goal, is kind of self-defeating, that the idea that the wolves are coming back and the level of predation. Yeah, and Yellowstone you may want to have, but now, in a, in a tougher situation, it's like Utah. Because now you've got nothing but algae crust soils, and they're telling tourists not to walk on the algae crust soils because they're trying to slow things down. But but not, the water can't penetrate. And so just over the fences on a lot of national parks in Utah, you're seeing uh, and land is still being grazed to some extent, and you'll actually see more, more vegetation. And it's like, I, I don't want to have continuous grazing, but like, for instance, um, we've got this problem with wetlands. We've got purple loosestrife loose everywhere in New England. And you can run a herd in there for two or three days and tromp all that down and get uh, cattails coming back and things like that. You don't do it all the time, but if, if, if your goal is to change the ecosystem in a certain way, uh, and, you know, cattle grazing can be a tool. And uh, in Yellowstone, if you've got an area, you know, what I was so amazed about the Maddox is, is when they got hay after a while, they never put it anywhere in the barn or anywhere where the grass was growing well. They put it someplace where they wanted the animals to go because they were thinking long term. Um, you know, cattle is just a tool. If, if I caught part of the gist of your question, it's about how do we coexist yeah. with wild and, and domesticated herds. You know, we're going to have farming, but I think part of the answer may be that the land is much more product, product. so maybe you can afford wolves taking a cow every once in a while, whereas before you you might have only had 10 cows, now you've got 1,000. Yeah. I think it's about to agree, and I, I would say the perception is as these animals are spread out from Yellowstone and into the wider country. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I, well, I think, yeah, Buffalo should be leaving Yellowstone soon, I hope. And um, you know, I, don't, I don't see a problem with that. They're know. getting shot by the government. Any, any vice yeah, I, I know. Are leaving being shot by the I know, government. I know. But, you know. Well, I, I don't know if it's a question, but perhaps a comment. Okay that um, one of the problems with cattle is that in many places like Brazil, Central America, they're sort of clearing out the mm. natural vegetation in order to start raising cattle primarily as an export crop. Mm. Mm. And um, that isn't having the positive effects that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I agree. But, I, agree. Yeah. I think that if, if, if you have a rainforest, you shouldn't get down a rainforest yeah. to, to do cattle, you know. But, it's, but on the other side of that is, uh, yeah, we have to think about how do people out there right. make a living and, and uh, you know, but yeah, it, you're absolutely right. Forest, forest shouldn't be sacrificed for, for grazing operations. I don't think that's yeah. a good idea. But, yeah. I don't know. Who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah, um, I have a question, and maybe it's for Adam. It's, it's sort of more of a philosophical question. I definitely understand about this think outside the box and the climate, people aren't thinking about this whole field, but I guess I'm also, I'm a little curious whether this presentation isn't thinking outside the box, because I love hummus, I love, or humus, I love microbes, I love mycelium, I grow them in my backyard. Anytime I take food scraps and wood chips and leaves and I make a pile that's larger than four by four by four, I'm creating microbes and then I'm spreading it out and I'm growing food. And so, it happens to be called compost, but it just seems like the people that talk about compost and the people that are talking about this ecosystem restoration aren't speaking to one another, and that really concerns me. And so I'm wondering why isn't compost part of all of this talk and about a huge movement, which is to find all of the food scraps in all of Maryland that are languishing in restaurants and in uh, grocery stores and all the leaves that are getting collected and putting into the landfill and that we could be growing soil, you know, making soil and compost and growing vegetables right here. So can someone explain to me why this isn't part of the same box and it's a different box in a different lecture in a different room? I don't, I don't think it's part of a different box. We just haven't touched on it today. One, one example, there was a, a report about three or four months ago in which the ranch in Marin County, California, the UC Berkeley professor was involved in this, where they spread compost on pasture land, a half inch. That's all they did. Most of the compost oxidized, but enough of it got into the soil that the, the microbes accelerated the below ground activity and the net flux was from CO2 into the soil. 
So the carbon content of the soil improved just from a one-time application of compost? Over, over a period of six years. Yeah. So the one-time application of compost had an effect that lasted for at least six years. So there are many, we've focused on the holistic management, the, the pasture animals, but there, the conference covered a whole range of things from biochar to compost tea. Yeah. So. We, we started, biodiversity as for a livable climate started as an outgrowth of the savory approach. <coughs> and we've expanded a lot. So we started, we thought we might become a savory hub, but we didn't. We branched out, and as far as I'm concerned, anything goes. If it works, we use it. Different things work for different people in different places. It's fine with me. Does some capture yeah. more carbon, some less? I don't care. As long as it gets in the ground and people are, are working on it. So, go ahead and pick, pick somebody. <laughs> <laughs> What's your influence strategy with this? This is a lot of information. My mind immediately goes to uh, what are the potential groups, urban dwellers who could be composting would be one, but are big industrial farmers part of your influence strategy I, initially? I, or I don't know. I, 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 uh, anyway, let me just get to the full question, which is, are you organizing, are you organizing study tours? Uh, do you have a lot of transfer of information? We, we don't have a lot of resources. We, most, most, from my point of view, and I'll let him talk, but from my point of view, I had all this stuff in my head. And I know it works. I want to share it. Yeah. And so these guys gave me a platform to share it, which is amazing, you know. And uh, and I, but see, it's like the John Todd dream was that you have millions of people doing this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and not being intimidated by scientists that say it can't be done or whatever. You try it and you see what happens and what works, and you've got a goal in your mind of what you want to do. But Adam is, is more thinking about the the, the bigger strategy of maybe. So. so I, th I think I said earlier on that one of our goals is to change the climate conversation to include biology as an important factor in climate work. Because if you can't think differently, you're not going to act differently. So we have to, so a first step for us is to change the climate conversation and to spread the discussion of biology and to collect examples, and there are many, many examples, and to talk to other organizations which have similar goals. Some might be working on a piece of it that's an important part of the whole. Some might be taking uh, a, more of a bird's eye view, which is what we're doing. Some may be directly on the ground, which we are not. But we're dipping our toes in, in those waters. Um, and in the process of changing the discussion, we expect that people start acting differently. So if everybody in this room, um, in addition to talking about emissions and how important it was to go to zero emissions and substitute and divestment and all of that, were also to talk about, hey, here's the other half of the equation. We need to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere into the ground. Emissions won't do it. So, and these are the steps we can take. We have to do carbon farming. We're having a suburban and urban carbon farming conference in Cambridge, Massachusetts on May 3rd, and people often ask us, people who aren't on large plots of land, ask us, well, what can I do in my town? Well, we've got 41 million acres of lawns in this country, and so we can start de-lawning. Um, um, and, and, using, and using native plants. I mean, the invasive plants are very destructive. And it's not their fault. They were fine where they came from. But when they came over here, it was, they were just went out of control. They didn't have the predators. They didn't provide the nutrients that local insects would eat. <coughs> and so we lose the insects and we lose the birds and, you know, et cetera and so forth. So starting to have these, these conversations, starting to turn lawns into resources of, of native plants, um, there's a long list of things to do, and having those conversations, first of all, getting people to do it next, and to start to build the picture so that you move from the old paradigm to the new one. So let's go with Mike and then Link. Okay. I'm, I'm familiar with the ranches up in high country, south of West Montana. Okay. And there are ranches that big lawn, they've been running for 100 years, for 100 years, the soils are getting progressively better and better. 
with practices which are not based on your knowledge, but their consistent practice of running their land. Okay. Have you been working with people like BLM, ranch owners? I, I have a person do. Or but any of the, 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 only, the only thing we're doing that I'm doing is uh, we've got one of the Grazers from Massachusetts, we're going to go out to uh, Lakota Nation, the Cheyenne River Reservation, and, and uh, we've got 8,000 acres that we want to make a plan for. And part of the plan is grazing, but part of the plan is also, they're, they're interested in the ideas of bringing beaver back and prairie dog back and those kind of things. So, so your I'm, story is consistent with good ranch practice. Oh yeah, yeah. If, if something's working, we don't have a, you know, you know I, I'm just looking for people that are curious that want to improve things. And, uh, you know, and, and there's plenty of that going on. We don't have to compete with anybody. No, I'm not talking about yeah, yeah, so. moving that process further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll advocate that if I, if I see it. Yeah. So who got? Who, yeah. um, Lee oh, okay. and Tricia? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lee. Um, I, I just wanted to touch on the point that you mentioned about turf grass. We're, we're with Safer in Montgomery here in Montgomery County, and we're working at the local level to help healthy off the soil at resident on turf grass. Because in Maryland, turf grass, like you mentioned, if, if turf grass was a crop, it's one of the largest crops, you know, and, and we spray the most amount of pesticides on these turf grass. And it's biologically, it's a living desert for um, wildlife. Um, so our goal in Montgomery County, we had a bill at the county level. So this is things that residents can do at the local levels. This seems like such a big issue, but we can definitely tackle these things at the local level. So at the local level, we have a bill at the county council that is calling for restrictions on the use of harmful lawn pesticides. So they're not only toxic to the, to the living system, but to, to people also. It gets into our drinking water. And I think there is, is like a lot of scientists uh, estimate that there's millions of gallons of these, these, uh, these pesticides, residential pesticides, in the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. So that's, uh, if you guys are interested, the, yeah, we have those postcards over at the table here. So uh, one thing you might, if you haven't looked into Pearl's Premium, and I'm not selling Pearl's Premium, but I happen to know the person who developed it, and he spent years experimenting with various combinations of, of native grasses. And to see to how you get a slow growing, <coughs> low water requiring grass, doesn't need mowing, etc. and so forth. You might look into it. I think it's kind of a transition um, for people who have to have lawns towards a, a more native um, planting. Can you, can, can you grow a cane blue stem uh, in Montgomery County? I don't, I don't know. Probably but, can, but you know, I mean, it's, it's, what are the best grasses to have here? The perennials in, in New England and in, in the East Coast. Uh, Matt, Matt, you could learn a lot from uh, Shenandoah Valley and that kind of thing, because there's still people that, that think about those things there. So. So, so if you want a book on this? Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Doug Calamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y, he's an entomologist. He wrote a wonderful little book, very readable and practical, called, called Bringing Nature Home. And he talks about how to make a transition from a lawn to native plantings and in a way that your neighbors might even be okay with. <laughs> What's his name? Doug Calamy, uh, Jim has a book oh, there, okay. T A L L A. -L -A, -L -A, -L -A, -L -A. A, lot of, a lot of books up screen. Well, most books that I show it on the screen are up here that you go look at. So we have about 10 minutes left. I want to give the next question to Tricia, but I was, just wanted to interject. You've gotten a couple hours of taste of what was a two and a half day conference. We want to, we want to bring that to the DC area. Their focus was bringing together scientists, land managers, and activists. We want to add policymakers to the mix here. So please think about that as we go forward and help us think about who should be at the table the next time around. Trisha. Yeah, uh, what I see as a big hole, and I realize you're just giving us two, three hours of what was a two and a half day conference. Was anyone looking at how to attack the, uh, the current uh, commercial agricultural practices of genetically modified foods. <coughs> um, we, we don't, we, we're not big on the attacking thing. Well, I mean, developing um, a strategy for... 
combating. There, are, you know, this world is full of people who are developing strategies to combat the bad guys. And my view is that um, there aren't enough people doing the right stuff because we're so busy combating the bad guys. And it's understandable. They're, they're very obnoxious. <laughs> and, and we want to you know, spray them with something. Has to be nonviolent. What we're finding, like the organic farmers in New England, are largely figuring out how do we grow food for people in Boston and, and other cities, and, and they're going about it that way. And the thing about impossibility terms, I think that's a lot more rewarding thing to be doing. And, um, and, it, and it actually makes some pretty good food, too. And, and there's quite a movement there. I think everybody knows that this whole thing that we're, you know, this, this corn uh, chemical system, you know, that's killing the soils pretty universally, is on its last legs. It's not going to last forever. And, and, and all, you can put all your energy into fighting it, but then you don't have food. Yeah. And so what do you do? You start learning how to grow food yourself and, and share it. So, so oh, by the way, sorry. <laughs> So there's, there's so many good ideas now when I come to talks like this. Um, yeah. rest, restoring soil, um, emissions reduction, it's all kinds of excellent ideas. And it doesn't seem like that's what we lack from my perspective. It okay. seems like what we lack is the political will to implement those ideas. You know, and, and a system that simply incentivizes the implementing of yeah. those ideas. You know, so I don't, I don't think it's a feasible strategy to simply relinquish that realm uh, and okay. say that you can do this independently of those existing structures and institutions that are preventing you to begin with. I mean, it seems this is a system economically that outsources as much of the cost, you know, what economics calls externalities, mm -hmm. and privatizes the profits, socializing the cost, privatizing the profits. You know, that's a system that if we're serious about dealing with climate change, you simply cannot what? work within that, yeah, that okay. Well, structure. Well, what if we um, incentivize young kids to go out on the land and do some of these practices rather than incentivize the growth of corn? You know, we subsidize corn, we subsidize the use of chemicals. Why don't we, why don't we just shift our whole thinking on that? You know, I, I agree with you. But it seems like fundamental structures need to change for that to happen. Well, so maybe what, so. what you said about, uh, about organizations competing with each other, it's probably, you know, from yeah. climate change to anti-war, yeah. to all kinds yeah. of environmental, you know, it's a system of social activism that fragments people and <laughs> fighting for limited attention yeah. in a way in which they cannot, by innate constraints, compete with big money. Okay? So, what about, and so, what about, so I'm what saying, about, unite, that, that what needs to happen essentially is more cooperation across interdisciplinary oh, yeah. Regions on a common denominator, like okay. getting money out of politics. So let, let me just like let me just talk that a little bit um, before I interject. This is going to be going around. If you've got a few dollars you can spare, you help us defray the cost of running this thing. Um, I've I've had this discussion a lot, and. What I see happening is people want to do exactly what you're proposing. And I've wanted to do exactly what you're proposing. And the way it comes out is, first we've got to do da 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 So if we first have to do da 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 change the system. Well, all my life I've been talking with people who are going to change the system. And we're going to march on Washington and we're going to get... These guys elected, and we're going to kick those guys out. And you can go back 100 years and the same thing. And you can go back 200 years and the same thing. You can go back to 500 years. The same process over and over and over again. And we never kick the guys out. We can't. I would propose even to say that it's an impossibility. A literal impossibility. Just like a perpetual motion machine to kick the guys out, and that's a much longer discussion, and it has to do with basic biology and human evolution, but that's the way we are constructed. So if, if we, for the sake of argument, say, we can't do what you're suggesting, what I have spent a good part of my life suggesting, what a lot of progressive activists suggest, let us hypothesize 
that we cannot do that, that that's an impossibility. Then what? So now we're opening, opening a whole other universe of questions. And part of what we're trying to address is the then what? How does, for example, a few years ago I started talking about all this grass-fed beef stuff. So I was, on, I was a vegetarian for 40 years and a vegan for 15 of those. But I thought, well, I've got to find out some more about this stuff. So I went and I bought 100% grass-fed hamburger. Well, the hamburger wasn't grass but you know what I mean. <laughs> and I, I get out the ketchup and the cheese and the onions and all that, and I cook up this hamburger, and I take one bite of it, and I put all that stuff away because it tasted so good. And I realized why we use all that stuff, because our meat has no flavor. And if we start producing meat, and this is what our colleague Rich Shin and... Um, John, John Wilkes knows about. If we start producing food like that and people discover it, well, maybe, maybe factory agriculture will go the way of the slide rule. <laughs> I, it just, it no longer applies. That's the only way I see of doing it. Because you're, you're never going to tumble the walls of, of the capital. Yes. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I, I applaud whatever you're trying to do and trying to learn how to work together and that kind of thing. That's, that's, uh, I need what to I'm saying oh. is challenging that a common denominator uniting the fragmented system of social activism and public interest at the root of what is so many of the cause of yeah. what's happening. And you trace that to money to politics. You can begin there. It's very simple. There's a lot of other things like uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll trace it. I'll trace it back for like it. Let's have this conversation offline because I think sure. a few more people want to ask well, questions. But we actually, we actually need the lease on this plot of land is run out. <laughs> 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 and we need we need to vacate the building because there are other people coming in. But I, I wanted to make one last pitch for mother daughter team Leah and Anna Rampy. I can then give uh, a recap and an updated version of Al Gore's slideshow talk. Um, I like to think I'm keeping up pretty much on what's happening with climate change. I was stunned and devastated to hear the updated data. So if you need a motivator, I believe they're on the road. I'm willing to go to your community to speak. Uh, with that, I'd like to try to keep appreciating the time. If you need another motivator of a third kind, um, this this uh, book by our friend Judy Schwartz, Cow Save the Planet, gives you a great overview of the eco restoration possibilities, other improbable ways of restoring soil and healing the earth. So we've got a few copies up here for 15 bucks. Special today.